presentation. Uh, before we um, before we get going, if everybody who isn't speaking would mind muting their microphones, it just helps reduce any feedback. Um, so just wait for folks to do that. Uh, I think Stephanie and Steve, your your microphones are unmuted. If you wouldn't mind muting. Sorry. No worries. It's it. It's sometimes you know it just starts out that way. Well, thank you all for joining us this Saturday morning. I'm Lauren Sullivan. I work for Natural Resources Conservation Service in um, Salinas, California. And this is our second wildlife webinar for California Environathon 2020. We're so glad that you guys could make it here on a Saturday morning. Um, we have a presentation, presentator, sorry, a great presenter today that Alima will introduce, but I'm first gonna just lay out some groundwork of how we do these webinars. We will be recording them. Hopefully, fingers crossed, this recording works, unlike the last one we did. Um, if you have questions, you can put them into your chat box and Alima and I will be monitoring those for Sherry, or you can raise your hand and we'll call on you and you can uh, just ask your question yourself. Whatever you're comfortable with, um, you can ask questions as we go along. We'll take a couple of breaks. Um, if you have a really pressing question as we're going, feel free to raise your hand while we're doing that. And then we'll have more time for general questions at the end. So if you've got questions that are a little off topic, let's wait till the end of the presentation and we can take some extra time to explore some different issues. So I'm gonna hand it off to Alima so she can introduce our presenter today. Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, we are really lucky today to have secured uh, one of the leading conservationists at the Marine Corps Air, oh, I'm gonna get it wrong, MAGTAF MCAG C. It is the largest Marine Corps installation in the United States. They have over, I think a thousand square miles of uh, terrain a very large and complicated um, training regimen that occurs there and a lot of environmental uh, impacts that occur. So there's a lot of uh, management issues that go on at that base. And uh, we are lucky today to have um, Dr. Sherry Shiflett, who is their natural resources specialist, to talk to us uh, in particular with a focus on the environment's um, main uh, uh, topic, I guess, which is the trash and sustainability. So um, Sherry, thank you for taking time out of your Saturday today to be with us. And if you'd like to uh, hop on in and, and let's hear a little bit about the Marine Corps. All right, thank you so much for welcoming me, Alima. I appreciate it. I actually just joined the base in June. So I'm fairly new to this area, but I've very quickly gotten up to speed learning about desert tortoise. That's our um, threatened species that we have on the base. And we do a lot of management for them, which you're gonna hear about throughout this talk. Um, we also have really cool species out here like desert bighorn sheep, burrowing owls, um, unique, you know, bat species, all sorts of things. But today we're going to talk about coyotes and ravens and trash management. So let me get that going. All right. Just a second. Okay. So is everybody able to see the presentation or that? Looking yes, good. it looks yes. good. Okay, perfect. So we're going to talk about coyotes and ravens and how does trash play a role in management of these unique species? So first off, we all have seen litter, trash, right? Um, it doesn't look great. It's for one thing, it's illegal to do it. Not that that deters everybody. Uh, it smells terrible. And then one thing that people don't always think about is that litter is a pollutant. So actually, 60% of water pollution is due to litter. And, you know, so what happens is when it rains, and it actually does rain sometimes in the desert, right? You have trash sitting on the ground and it might have toxic chemicals in it or leachates that are in those, you know, plastics, for instance. And then that percolates into our groundwater, gets carried away. And so even though litter may be at one particular site, its impacts can be much more widespread because of a vector like water. Um, it also can spread diseases, okay? So you have things that are decomposing in this material and it attracts wildlife. So we're gonna talk about that a lot today, that litter and food and you know just colorful things like plastics can attract birds and other animals to eat them. And it can also cause other issues like maiming wildlife, right? Like let's say it's a rusty can, for instance, that cuts an animal or you might have a, um, We've all seen like the soda cans and you have the plastics, the loops that hold them together. 
in some cases, animals get their head stuck in these or like a sea turtle, right? And their body grows like an hourglass around it. Another harmful thing with litter with wildlife is that it can influence animal behavior and diet. So we'll talk about that a lot, how animals, if there's litter out there, they're drawn to it. And this can lure them into roadways. It can lure them into human settlements and it can cause further issues. So these are some pictures that one of my coworkers took in the desert. I'm gonna show you a series of some pictures, just taking a walk around. And one of the things that we've noticed is there's a lot of litter out here, right? And some people just dump things in the desert. It's kind of become a dumping ground because there's not a lot of enforcement on this. And it's really problematic because you have things like these boards that may have rusty nails in them. There might be sharp edges on the metal or wood that's treated with chemicals. And like we said before, think about this, it's not gonna just stay in this one place. It gets scattered throughout the environment and you get materials that get moved around or um, pollution. And so unfortunately what happens is that our very beautiful desert landscape that you can see here on the left, it just starts to become ugly, right? It becomes degraded. And so, you know, there's all this debris out there, whether it's in this picture, you see coat hangers and plastics, or um, one that comes to my mind is mylar balloons. You know, people don't often think about when they, when they release a balloon, where does it go? Well, I can tell you, a lot of it winds up in the desert, you know, like so many days I go out to do field work and I almost always see at least one balloon, if not three, four or five that are tangled up in the shrubs. I used to work on barrier islands on the East Coast. Same thing, I would go out to the islands and I would find balloons. So it's really important to think very carefully about these kinds of things when we're releasing them into the environment. Another problem is that they can become lodged in wildlife burrows and impact animals that way and trap them in their burrows. Some other debris that we see just by doing a walk around our neighborhood, things like an old pickup truck bed, and that's filled with even more trash, you know? Um, you might see things like discarded mattresses. In fact, you know, my neighbors one time threw away a mattress and they didn't call to have it removed. It sat out there for two months, you know? And so you can have animals that are attracted to these things as well as as the materials start to break down, they spread into the environment. Um, or tires, there's a lot of tires that get discarded in the desert. And so um, the California Integrated Waste Management Board has said that these are carcinogenic and they can cause cancer and gene mutations, right? Especially if there's toxins that then get into our water supply and our water systems. Another thing that we see a lot of when we walk around is feces, okay? So um, if you just look at the ground, you might see uh, domestic canid feces. So what does this mean? Um, basically people's dogs that they're not picking up after. So I'm gonna use the term canid a lot today. And when I say that, what I mean is any type of um, dog-like carnivore, okay? So your own dog, if you have one, or a coyote is another type of canid, a kit fox, a gray fox, red fox, all these things are canids. And so when you see waste like this, you might think, well, what's the big deal, right? It's gonna break down. It actually takes a long time to break down, especially in the desert, right? It depends on the system. Another issue is that it can have a lot of toxins in it as well that leach out into the environment. It can carry diseases and spread that to other wildlife. So when there's scat like this, so another term for feces for wildlife is scat, um, it can actually bring in other animals. So like you might have a coyote that's then attracted to your dog's scat. And so then if this happens near a roadway, it can lead to roadkill and animal strikes because they get pulled in and drawn in by this. So one thing that I would challenge you to do is when you're going on a walk around your neighborhood, take a look around you. Do you notice any of these things? Do you see excess trash? Do you see excess feces? And think about what can I do about that? Is there something that I can do as a citizen to help, you know, prevent this problem, you know, ameliorate it, make it less of an issue. So when we think about litter, first, it's kind of important to talk about, well, how does it affect wildlife? I've already alluded to some of this, but when an animal ingests trash, it can actually impact its nutrient absorption, right? Because it can get into its intestinal system 
And then instead of it being able to extract nutrients from good foods, it's no longer able to because it's blocked up by all these plastics and other toxins and toxic chemicals. Another issue is that these chemicals can actually bioaccumulate. So what that means is when an organism eats, you know, trash and plastics and, um, you know, metals and other things, it will accumulate it in its tissues in a way that's faster than what it can metabolize. And then if that animal dies and another animal eats it, it actually can magnify in those tissues as we move up the food chain. So not only do we have this bioaccumulation, but we also get magnification of that too. Um, and then as I was talking about before, you can have animals that are, you know, entrapped by the litter. So you see in this upper picture, we've got this coyote and his head is stuck in a um, plastic bin, right? Maybe he'll get that off, maybe he won't, right? He might be stuck um, for the rest of his days. Um, we've also seen things like smaller animals getting attracted to plastic bottles, like when people throw away their Coke bottles and like little shrews, for instance, and they'll just die in there. In fact, I knew a biologist, that was the way he collected shrews because he would just go looking for plastic bottles because they would frequently be in there on the East Coast, this happened. Um, another thing we see is just general disfigurement, starvation, death. And then when these animals get fed trash, it can actually affect their behavior. Okay, so we can see changes in terms of animals congregating in ways that they otherwise wouldn't, and that's going to cause more disease transmission. It's also going to disrupt ecological dynamics. Okay, so like with predator prey. So when there's extra, you know, food and resources available in the environment in human areas, predators are no longer interested in chasing down wildlife naturally. So you might see a coyote who would normally go for a rabbit is instead going to dumpster dive and go for that cheeseburger or the bag of chips. Um, so we actually get this disruption in terms of ecosystem dynamics and also alterations in their gut microbiome. So recent research in 2020 has come out showing that it affects the coyote's immune system. All right, so today what I really wanna focus on is talking about coyotes and common ravens. These are two species that we find in the desert and we're considering them problem species right now, not because innately they're a problem, right? They're not but they're a problem because of either their populations have exploded, like in the case of ravens, and I'll show you that, or coyotes, we're seeing a big change in their behavior and in the way they interact with humans. And so both of these species are considered generalist. What that means is that, you know, they can eat just about anything um, dietary wise. They're also really adaptable. So for instance, with coyotes, you'll find them in the desert, you'll find them in the mountains, um, you'll find them you know, in more like grassland areas, and then also urban areas, right? We see them throughout urbanized settings um, all across the country. You know, Even when I lived on the East Coast, you see coyotes, not as frequently depending on the city as out here in the desert, but um, certainly coyotes are everywhere. And then these animals are also very intelligent. So ravens, super smart. They're really good at figuring out puzzles. They're really good at figuring out deterrence, like we'll talk about later, and adapting to them. And they're both tolerant of harsh conditions. That's why they can survive in the desert. Okay, so let's look at coyotes a little bit more first. Um, a little history on coyotes in California. They've actually been around quite a long time, so it's estimated that they've been here since the Holocene which is the last ice age about 12,000 years ago. And since the 1950s, their geographic range has actually expanded by 40% in the US. So we are seeing a big change in terms of the range. Like they're, they're really moving into wider areas that they never did before. And scientists think that this is because of reduced predator pressure um, so there's more urban fringes for coyotes to live on, and there's going to be fewer predators there because they're driven out by humans. There's also going to be more suitable habitat. Like I said, um, human settlements has made life easier for coyotes. And then this all feeds into this idea of increased subsidization, subsidization by humans. That's a bit of a tongue twister. I had to practice it a few times, actually. 
Um, and that's going to be a big thing that we're talking about today is this idea of a human subsidy. And so what I mean by that is what we've already talked about, trash, okay? Basically, you have human settlements. We throw away a lot of things. We're not even aware of it necessarily, right? Sometimes we throw things in the trash. We don't even think about it anymore. But maybe that trash bin blows over or the top comes off. Well, then suddenly it's become a subsidy for something else. Another subsidy is going to be water, which we'll talk about a little bit. So with coyotes, um, CDFW, which is the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, they estimate that the population is between 250,000 to 750,000 coyotes in California. It is a bit of a range because we don't know exactly how many, but that's still you know, quite a large number of animals throughout the state. And then another really interesting thing about these animals, there was a study done in 2020 in Southern California and they took whiskers of the coyote and they actually analyzed the nutrient contents of those whiskers. Um, it's called a stable isotope analysis where they looked at things like nitrogen and carbon. And they were able to show that 38% of the coyote diet in Southern California is actually human food. So um, that is substantial evidence that humans are um, contributing to the diet of coyotes in a big way. So when we think about coyotes, like I was saying, trash isn't the only subsidy that's out there. Water is another one to think about, okay, especially in the desert where water is scarce and hard to come by. Um, so any leaking water points, irrigation for plants, man-made water supplies, whether it's like a wastewater treatment pond or a um, just a water, you know, water supply area is going to subsidize many coyotes. All right, so urban coyotes, just a second here. Mm. These are going to be coyotes that are specifically drawn into that urban setting, right? And the reason that they're drawn in are because of all these subsidies and reduced predators. So as we've talked about throughout this presentation so far, they're attracted by trash, they're attracted by pet waste, and even by pet food. So it's really recommended that you not feed your pets outdoors because of this, because you can attract other wildlife by doing so. And one of the issues that arises here is that coyotes that would normally be fearful of humans, they're no longer as fearful in urban areas, especially when they get access to human foods and pet foods. It enables them to become more bolder and more aggressive. And in fact, we see this um, in our national parks, for instance, you know, you'll notice there's a lot of signs about not feeding wildlife, not feeding bears, disposing of food properly. And the reason is if that wildlife gets human food, it becomes more accustomed to it and it, it will be more aggressive towards humans to get that food. Um, another thing we see is that urban coyotes, they're scattering this litter around and again, like causing diseases and other issues. And we have just generally more human wildlife conflicts. So here you can see this small dog, a little pug, that's wearing some armor to protect himself from a coyote, right? Because if a coyote picked him up, he's probably a goner. Um, and you know, if you think about it, each of you have probably known somebody that's had their pet have a run-in with a coyote. I know of at least two or three people that I can think of that have had their pets taken by a coyote. And every year, there's more and more stories in the news about this. In fact, I was just doing a little bit of searching on it and finding some news stories out of Los Angeles. So I'll just read you one real quick. In Buena Park, a coyote entered a home through a doggy door and attacked two dogs, killing a 10-year-old Mountie Poo named Sally and leaving another dog injured. It required $2,000 worth of surgery to save its life. A similar story came out of San Dimas, where a coyote entered through a five inch opening in a sliding glass door and killed an eight year old Yorkie. And actually on our military base, we have housing for some of the military families. And a situation like this happened in the past couple of years where somebody left their um, sliding glass door open, coyote came in and took their dog. So it's certainly important to think about we have more coyotes in urban areas and keeping your pet safe, as well as keeping the wildlife safe. So not having more attractants for them. 
All right, in addition to being threats in our urban settings and for our pets, coyotes also present threats to um, more wildlife species like the desert tortoise, okay? And this is a big deal for us in the desert, especially where we have desert tortoise that's a threatened species already and their numbers are declining. So coyotes can cause issues for both adults and hatchlings. And that's what you see here in these images. So in the top right, this is an image of a tortoise who's um, basically his um, scales have been removed by a coyote. They've just been kind of chewed off and scraped off. That's gonna be a sign to us of coyote attack because it's really hard to actually chew through that tissue on a tortoise. Another thing that we notice is um, injury that happens to the scoots. So these are gonna be the plates on the back of the tortoise where you see these little hexagonal plates, they're called scoots. And so coyotes can actually flip tortoises over. Um, they can wait for them to right themselves. Because what a tortoise does to protect itself is it'll draw into its shell. But if a coyote flips it over, eventually the tortoise is gonna to wanna to right itself. And when it does so, it'll stick out its legs and the coyote will attack and it, it can chew those legs off actually. So you see that here in the bottom right picture. This is a tortoise who had both of his legs chewed off by a coyote. So it's pretty, you know, pretty detrimental to the tortoise when we see these attacks. They can also find their burrows and you know, dig them out of the burrows. But one piece of good news here is that scientists have done work looking at canid scat and they found that less than 3% of canid scat samples um, actually have desert tortoise tissue. So we're not finding that desert tortoise is a big component of the coyotes diet. All right, so we've talked a bit about coyotes. What about ravens? Because that's another key wildlife species to think about today. So the issue with ravens is that their populations are really exploding, especially in the desert. Um, studies have shown that in the past 37 years, we have over an 800, about an 800% increase in um, ravens. And so on this figure here, what I'm showing you is essentially, we're looking about the past hundred or so years, and this is the likelihood of seeing a raven versus all other avian species. And so what you notice here is that the likelihood of seeing ravens has actually increased quite a lot to almost 80%, whereas all other avian species have declined. Um, so ravens are really taking off. And why is that? Well, we can really tie it back to this idea of human subsidies. So one thing on this slide, you can actually see there's lots of these birds that are on the power lines, they're on the light structures. Okay, these are not natural things that we would find in the desert. You know, if you think about the desert, what's the tallest plant that's growing out here, right? We have some trees, but they're generally not that tall. Um, maybe you'll find some desert willows or some smokewood trees but they're nowhere near as tall as a power line. And so the power line gives the, the raven this subsidy and this nesting advantage to really look out over the landscape and to have safety from predators. So some other human subsidies that are really important for ravens are overflowing trash. Um, this is actually a picture that was taken on the marine base, you know, so we're also struggling with this issue of how to properly manage our trash, how to cover it, how to close the bins, um, how to communicate that to people that are constantly moving and shifting through the base. You know, we get a lot of transient Marines that maybe are only training there for a month or a few months at a time and then they move on. So as an environmental person on the base, it's hard to get that message out and you know, cultivate trash um, disposal in a proper way. Another issue that we have is roadkill. So, you know, some people may think, oh, the ravens are helping, they're cleaning up the roadkill. But actually, it's just the opposite, right? The roadkill is attracting the ravens, and the roadkill is creating another subsidy. And if you think about it, the roadkill, there's more of it because there's more humans, there's more cars on the road, there's more roads. And so as wildlife are trying to cross, there's going to be more incidences where they get hit. Um, and then this picture of this water tank I'm showing you, it's actually what's called a water buffalo. And they're used for storing water for industrial purposes and things. And sometimes these leak. And when they leak, they can also bring in ravens and other animals like coyotes. 
Um, okay, and then lastly, we've got this raven nest on the power pole, okay? And, you know, it's not just the nest that's a problem, right, in all of these nests here. It can cause electrical fires, it can cause um, downed power, and it costs a lot of money to actually repair all of these things. Okay, so speaking of that, when we're talking about economics, ravens have big economic impacts throughout the US and also on our marine base. Um, so they have economic impacts and health and safety. What I'm showing you here are some of the facilities on the base where we actually uh, house the equipment. Okay, so whether that's military vehicles or some of the uh, military weapons and um, other equipment that's being used for training, it has to get stored somewhere, right? And so we have these built structures that house them and they're shade created, but it creates a lot of perching habitat for ravens. And then when they're perching and they're sitting there for a long time, they're creating a pretty big mess, as you can see here, right? You see raven droppings everywhere. And you might think, well, okay, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is it costs a lot of money to clean all of that up. And it also creates a, a health hazard, right? because we've noticed things like Newcastle disease, West Nile, um, H1N1, H5N1, Salmonella, all of these viruses are tied to um, Corvid feces and other you know, avian feces. Economically, raven damages uh, reported to the USDA in 2018 were over $5 million. Okay, so we're talking about a really big impact. And it's challenging to get at some of those numbers, but that includes things like this kind of waste. It also includes things like ravens will eat crops and grains and nuts, and um, they'll even kill small livestock. Not so much of an issue on the base, but an issue in the broader sense. And then on the base, um, the economic impact is that for cleaning this equipment, it costs several thousand dollars annually. Okay, so you actually have to pay a technician four hours a day for two months, okay? So that's the job for two months straight is to clean some of this up. But in order to do it, it's gonna take him 3000 gallons of water, okay? So that's a big use of water, as well as that person's gonna need some personal protective equipment so that he can prevent himself from getting one of these diseases. Additionally, you know, we've looked at things like putting um, anti-perching devices or studying ravens We've spent on the base over $300,000 on, you know, raven proofing some of these areas and it hasn't fully worked. We've also spent another 300,000 studying ravens and where they're moving. Okay, so in addition to having economic impacts and health and safety, ravens also impact desert tortoises, okay? So they're a big threat for the tortoise. And the evidence that we have here is the hollow peck shells. Basically what happens is the ravens, they can poke their beak through the shell of a hatchling. And actually it takes about eight years for a desert tortoise to form a shell that is hard enough so that it's um, protected from a raven attack. Before that, it's just too soft and vulnerable. It's almost like a soft shell crab, okay? For those of you familiar with East Coast crabs. Um, and it, it just takes a while before it fully hardens. And before that time, it's super vulnerable. So one thing that I found was, if we're looking at the dietary requirements of a raven, for one day, they could either eat one cheeseburger, or if we're equating that to tortoises, nine hatchlings, okay? So it takes them nine hatchlings worth to get their daily energy requirement. Um, and we have evidence that they are, you know, poking these hatchlings. There have been anecdotal stories of piles of hatchlings under a single pair of raven's nest. And um, people have done studies where they've put out fake tortoises to monitor the number of attacks that a raven is having on it. Okay, and I wanna show you a quick video. So let's hope I can do this right. Okay, one second. Make sure I get the sound.
desert tortoises spend 90% of their time in underground burrows, which can be shallow or as long as 30 feet. There they hibernate in winter and stay cool in summer, when the burrow temperature may be 40 degrees cooler than the searing heat above. Desert tortoises can live to be over 50 years old. We're tapping him out with the hopes that uh, when he hears noise, he's gonna come charging out of the burrow, right on cue. You ready? While deaths from upper respiratory tract disease triggered the endangered species listing, additional threats are multiplying. Ravens have become an increasingly deadly predator of young tortoises. The easiest place to find raven nests is underneath power towers. Yeah, they're back for a visit. Sticks blown off the nest. Oh. Here's a tortoise that's been eaten by a raven. It's a characteristic that they'll peck a hole in the top uh, to kill it. In northern forests such as Maine, ravens are still a wilderness bird. In the Mojave Desert, which has had uh, urban sprawl and, and uh, so many human modifications, uh, ravens are, have increased <clears throat> up to a thousand percent in the last 50 years. And the availability of food uh, has just caused this huge population increase. They're social birds and they congregate around landfills, around sewage ponds, around fast food restaurants, cattle yards, horse properties, anywhere where there's easy food. But the ones that have learned to uh, uh, eat juvenile tortoises, they can decimate a generation of tortoises right around the nest. So those ravens are targeted. And if they find evidence of a tortoise predation under a raven nest, then the Bureau of Land Management calls the Wildlife Services Department of the USDA and, and they come out and kill the raven. The power company comes out and knocks down the nest. They're just so adaptable. And then they teach the young uh, that tortoise is uh, good eating. So the next generation becomes a tortoise predator too. Bear with me one second and get back to the PowerPoint. Okay. All right, so um, as you can see from that video, it kind of ties together several of the facets of what I've been talking about, right, with having trash subsidies and human environments and then the impact that we're seeing to desert tortoise. So why is this a big deal with desert tortoise? Well, if we look at tortoise population trends, what we're finding is that they've declined dramatically, actually, over the past century. And because of this, the federal government, the U U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, decided to list them as federally threatened in the Mojave Desert since 1990. Well, even since they've gotten this protected status, we're still seeing population declines, actually. And in 2018, a study was done that looked at um, tortoise population in the eastern Mojave from 2004 to 2018, and they found that the adult population was at 33% of what it was. So that's over a 77% essentially population decline. And some of the major issues here are things like, you know, of course we have predators, right? Ravens and coyotes, we've been talking about that. But it's bigger than that, okay? We're seeing issues with habitat loss, with human development, more roadways intersecting this habitat and it makes it harder for them to cross those roads more off-road vehicle travel, 
um, which is a big deal in the desert. There's a lot of people that like to do off-road vehicles, but you got to do it in a smart way, right? Um, especially because it can have big impacts and it can be left on the landscape for a long time. I've heard it called like scars in the desert, essentially, because it takes a long time to heal. Collection, you know, for many people, tortoises are a novelty, okay? So they want to go out and collect these animals. We also have issues with invasive plants, um, non-native plants that are coming into these areas and spreading and taking away native plants, okay? So they're taking away that habitat and a food source for the tortoise. Um, and then another threat, of course, is military activity. You know, if you look at the maps, there are military bases throughout the desert, okay? And even the base I work on, like we're very well aware that military training is having an impact on tortoise habitat. There's no way that it can't, right? When you're talking about this equipment, vehicles, troops, all these things kind of running around the environment. But um, the military, and I'll show you what McCaxey is doing in a minute, is doing a lot of things because of this awareness to help the species. So um, what is McCaxey doing? That's the Marine Corps Air Ground Combat Center where I work. Um, we do quite a bit for the species. And so first off, if we wanna talk about raven management, the, what we're doing with raven management is we're putting in things like perch deterrence. So I think I told you we've installed over you know, $300,000 worth of bird spikes, of wires, it's hard to see in this image, but the red arrow is pointing to a little wire, and below that wire is another wire where the birds would actually um, perch on. But by having this upper one at an angle, it makes it so that if a bird does perch on the low wire, they're like wobbling. And so energetically, it demands a lot of energy to maintain a balance, and it's just very uncomfortable. So it keeps a bird from doing it. The problem is, you can't deter every single surface, right? Because what happened was, okay, so the ravens no longer use that area, but they just find another spot, okay? So they're just kind of moved around. Um, we also do things like hazing where we have air cannons. These are just really loud um, blasts of air and big blasts of air. Whalers, which are noisemakers, clapping and making loud noises. All of these things drive ravens away but they get used to them, okay? So they also adapt to that. Another innovative thing that we're doing is falconry, okay? So you can see in this image here, we have one of our other biologists, Robin, and she's holding a falcon. Um, his name is Floyd, and he has a falconer, you know, who's the master for him. And basically what we do with the falconry is we bring Floyd in, and you can see him here perched in the bottom right on a Connex box. And he perches on a site where it's really popular for ravens to come in and roost. And he just has to come in there every day for about a couple hours before sunset when the ravens would be getting ready to roost. And it'll prevent them from roosting. It only takes that one falcon to actually prevent, you know, over a couple hundred ravens from roosting. And the reason this works is because, quite frankly, they're afraid of him. And so we're playing around with falconry to see how we can use it in certain areas. But keeping in mind that it doesn't remove the ravens, it does push them out to other areas. However, we can keep them away from our critical resources like that equipment that I was showing you earlier that got fouled up by the ravens. Uh, we also destroy inactive nests uh, when the ravens aren't using them, so that way they can't use them in the future. And we do monitoring, okay? So we do some tracking on the ravens. We go to certain sites in the evening and look at how many ravens are using those particular sites to get an idea of where they're moving. When it comes to coyotes, uh, we have several things in place for coyotes as well. First, we have conservation law enforcement officers and they will respond to nuisance coyote calls. So as I mentioned, occasionally there are run-ins between humans and coyotes. And coyotes can become aggressive. So those particular animals do have to be dealt with from the Cleos, that would be our law enforcement officers. And then just general hazing, right? Like, so making the loud noises and scaring them away. Um, I found this guide online from the Burbank Police Department that says things like, you know, make sure you're keeping your pets indoors, carry noisemakers to scare them off, pick up small pets if you spot a coyote. And then as we talked about before, like don't feed any wildlife, don't walk your pets um, on retractable leashes, 
leave, don't leave pet food out um, for feeding and things like that. So with Macaxi, another really cool thing that we're actually doing is we are doing a SCAT study where we have had researchers come in from um, Texas. I want to say it's maybe the University of Texas or Texas Tech. It's something like that. They are coming in and they're collecting SCAT samples of canids of foxes and coyotes from all around the base, which is a very large base. And they are analyzing those tissues for remains of desert tortoise because we wanna see if on our um, base, if we're seeing more than that 3% number, if it is really a big issue for us, or if it's something that we can um, you know, prioritize in terms of management, maybe ravens are more of the problem for us than coyotes at the moment. Okay, we also do a lot of outreach and education. And we do this on the base, as well as occasionally participating in areas in the local community, whether that's in Joshua Tree or Yucca Valley. Um, every year we, we celebrate Earth Day, so we have outreach associated with that and put together um, booths showing people what kind of wildlife they can encounter on base, teaching them about some of these issues with raven management, teaching them about desert tortoise. We also have an annual desert tortoise celebration, and this is larger than just Macaxi. You know, this is something that's celebrated by the Fish and Wildlife Service, it's celebrated by BLM. Um, and other entities, it happens every year in October. So look for that because sometimes you'll see social media talk about different desert tortoise events that are around. And then we do routine environmental briefs. So what I mean by that is anybody that comes to work on the base, they have to be trained in terms of environmental awareness. So they have to watch a video learning about desert tortoise, learning about unique um, wildlife resources we have and ways to, um, protect the environment, okay? So just raising that awareness. And then perhaps one of our most interesting things that we do and most you know, um, rewarding for the desert tortoise and helpful for the species is head starting. And so this is really cool. It involves um, actually monitoring wild female tortoises, figuring out when they're gonna lay eggs, collecting those eggs and raising them um, and raising those hatchlings until they get to a certain size, putting them out into a captive rearing site, which I'll show you in a minute, and then raising them essentially until they're large enough to be protected by protected from ravens. So as I mentioned before, that's about eight years time. It's a large time investment of raising these animals. And then eventually we release them back into the wild. So you can see here in these images what a little um, hatchling looks like when it's first emerging. And then, you know, they're very, very small, like the size of a Dixie cup for the first year or two of their life. And really, like I said, it takes about eight years before they have that hardened shell. They're still pretty small animals. It takes about 25 years before they get about this large. Okay, so at Macaxi, we have this site called Tracers which you can see in the upper picture here. This is the tortoise research and captive rearing site. It was built in 2006 and it has hundreds of tortoise pens. Okay, so once these you know, eggs are hatched, they're raised um, in incubators for the first couple years of their life, or I guess maybe the first year or so, and then they're put in tracers for the next six or so years until they reach a size appropriate to be released back into the environment. Um, and what we found actually is that 85 to 96% of the hatchlings survive per year in the wild. And comparing this to natural survival rates, those are only 50%. So we're actually having an enhanced survival rate because of this head starting program. And you can really think of head starting like that, right? Like you're giving them a head start in life. You're helping protect them from things that would normally be um, more of a threat. And so this picture on the bottom showing you one of the first releases that we had in um, 2015, this was one of the first 35 tortoises released into the wild, okay? And so we have this Marine who's gently setting this nine-year-old hatchling down. So you can see, or sorry, nine-year-old juvenile who hatched nine years ago. Um, and I wanna show you another short video. Here at the Marine Corps Base in 29 Palms, we have a robust environmental program. 
the desert tortoise is the one that actually gets the most attention because it is the sole species that's protected under the Endangered Species Act. In 2005, we constructed a facility with the concept of doing head starting. And head starting is basically monitoring female tortoises in the spring, identify when they are gravid or essentially pregnant with eggs, and then we bring them into our facility, which actually protects them as well as the nests from predators. When the hatchlings emerge to the surface, we start measuring the babies and identify them and placing specific ID tags on each one. Then for several years, we monitor their growth. And then over time, we now have tortoises that are large enough, so it really reduces the likelihood that at least the common raven is going to attack and kill the baby tortoises. We've been extremely successful. We have a 96% annual survivorship of animals inside the facility. In the wild, it's less than 50% just in the first year. By enabling protection of the tortoise off installation, it liberates areas on the base for the Marines to train and execute their mission. Okay. Okay, so um, the gentleman that was speaking in that video, that's actually my supervisor, Dr. Brian Heenan, and he is an expert on desert tortoise. He actually did his PhD and his um, studies after the PhD on desert tortoise, and he studied tortoises in the U.S. as well as in South Africa. So he's really such a great person to have running this facility because he knows so much about the animal and so much about their ecology. All right, so the base also does other things for desert tortoise. We have restricted areas on the base. And so what this means is that we have certain spaces that are set aside and we've um, kind of installed boundaries around them. We have fencing around them and they're marked on the maps for the Marines so that they know these are areas where they can't train, where they can't drive off road. So there's no off-road vehicle travel and there's no live fire in these areas. And the reason we do this is because we have specific zones where we have more tortoises. So there's going to be more tortoises that um, are in those areas. Or if we capture tortoises in areas where they're doing a lot of training, we can move them to these restricted areas so that they have more protection. And we have other sensitive resources that may be occurring, like archaeology resources, for instance. So we do this in such a way that we are providing more protections for the animals on the base and um, as a way to offset so that the Marines can train in areas they need to train and know that they're not going to have as much impact on um, our sensitive species. So those are some of the things McCaxie is doing. What about other agencies? Um, well, other agencies are also doing aversion methods, okay? So ways to kind of scare away or prevent coyotes and ravens. And some of these, you know, include things like, um, well, I'll show you in a minute with attractants and repellents, but also raven egg oiling and egg addling, destroying inactive nests, monitoring desert tortoise populations so that we can get a better understanding on how, you know, tortoise is responding to things like head starting and um, translocation, which means moving tortoises from one area to another garbage disposal management. Like I mentioned with the park service earlier, they do a great job at um, managing trash and having these really heavy trash bins that you have to physically use your hands to um, push in the lever and lift the lid to prevent wildlife from getting in. And then generally education and outreach. So each of these other agencies are doing some combination of this. With aversion, um, specifically what I mean is things like having a fake tortoise that maybe gives an electric shock to an animal, like a light shock, right? Or emits flashing lights or noise, you know? So if a coyote approaches, it's gonna make a lot of noise, like an alarm, like danger intruder, and it's gonna scare that animal away. Um, another thing people do is maybe take these fake tortoises and spray them with grape extract or spray them with a bird repellent so that it prevents, you know, it's just like a bitter taste that the birds don't like. And this can be sprayed over landfills and dumpsters as well. Um, I mentioned egg oiling. So for those of you not familiar with that, what this means is to basically coat the outside of an egg with vegetable oil or another similarly viscous oil 
and that's going to make the egg no longer viable. It can't hatch. And it's very effective, which is great. However, it has some downsides too. Um, first, it takes a lot of time to just find these nests, to potentially climb cliffs to find them, and then also to spray them by hand. So it's really expensive in terms of man hours and the effort to do it. In some cases, drones are used to find the nests. And then another thing with egg oiling that's actually really effective is once the egg is sprayed, the um, raven nesting pair, they will stay on those eggs. They won't lay more because they think those eggs are viable. Okay. And so these particular things that other agencies are doing that we're doing, the reason we're doing this is because the Fish and Wildlife Service has determined that there's a goal to get raven densities to 0.64 ravens per kilometer squared that that's a goal where if we have those densities, it's less predation pressure on the tortoise. And this is specifically for the desert. Currently, we're at this 1.23 to 2.3 ravens per kilometer square. So we have more ravens than um, the desert can support for tortoises right now. But we need to use a combination of these me uh, methods like egg oiling, destroying nests, aversion, trash management, all of these different things. And then as I was saying, um, we do desert tortoise population monitoring and so do other agencies. Like they're gonna monitor their health, they're gonna do condition assessments, they're gonna take calipers to look at what's the width um, and the length of the shell. Uh, we also do radio tracking. So you can see the tortoise in the bottom right has a radio transmitter on its back. And that's what this woman is doing here. She's using a um, radio telemetry device and it's basically an antenna because the tracker broadcasts a signal so that we can find those tortoises. So we actually do this for tortoises that are in the wild. We've been monitoring them for well over a decade to see, you know, are they making new burrows? Where are they at? What areas are they using year after year? And then we monitor tortoises that are released into the wild. Um, and then you can see here on the bottom left, Dr. Heenan who's showing He's doing some outreach with this juvenile tortoise and at the tracers facility. So these are things that we're doing that other agencies are doing, but I want to emphasize that there are things that you can do too, and there's ways that you can help protect desert and resident wildlife. Okay, we can all make a difference in this battle. Um, and so specifically, when you think about this, what can I do as an individual, right? Um, well, we talked a lot about trash, so the Number one thing is probably don't litter, obviously, but also properly dispose of litter. You know, if you see trash that you're comfortable picking it up, do so. Like have an extra bag with you sometimes so you can pick up some of this trash. Or for your own trash, make sure that you're, you know, securing it really well so it doesn't get blown away. Um, recycle trash. Um, also, make sure you're taking out your trash cans on time and not overfilling them. Like I was saying, secure those lids you know, secure other lids if you see them open. Keep wildlife wild, okay? This goes back to what we talked about earlier, not feeding wildlife. It is it is actually harmful to the wildlife to get them more used to humans, becoming more aggressive. You're disrupting their behavior dynamics and you're gonna cause them more problems in the long run. And unfortunately, a lot of animals that become aggressive towards humans end up having to be put down because they are considered nuisance animals. Um, and then, of course, you know, just generally staying educated, spreading the word, doing your part to keep the desert clean and protecting our wildlife, supporting environmental advocacy groups, donating, um, volunteering time, you know, donating doesn't have to be money, it can also be just time or helping to educate others. Okay, so that is what I have for you, but I was wondering, based on everything I've presented today, what, you know, you think. Do you think there's ways that we can discourage coyotes and ravens from occupying an area? And feel free to raise your hand or you can just speak up if you've got some ideas. Um, this is Hovita. I have a question and Sherry, I have to say, that was an incredible presentation. It was so comprehensive and just enough detail to really, I think, stimulate a lot of thinking on everyone's part and for me as well. But I was wondering, 
when you were talking about habitat loss for the desert tortoise in terms of you know the habitat loss invasive and non-native plants um in in their in their habitat can any of that be attributed as well as the populations of these of these animals to climate change um yes actually that is a great question and you know that's one of the things that we're looking at or we have actually been looking at recently is what's considered climate refugia for the tortoise and so we have scientists involved um my boss for instance dr heenan looking at as climate keeps warming what are going to be the suitable areas of habitat and we know that we're going to see a continued shrinkage of that habitat over time but we do have models to show like where that ideal habitat is going to be so that we can kind of predict it and you're absolutely right with climate change as it's kept warming then we are seeing a shrinkage in habitat another like really interesting thing that happens is um, when you think about sex ratios actually so you maybe have heard this before maybe not but when temperature is warmer, so like inside the burrow, there, there's a certain threshold where above a certain temperature, you only get females and below that temperature, you get males. So burrow temperature is incredibly important to determining sex, right? And so as temperatures warm and, you know, keep in mind, these burrows are constructed slightly underground, so they're going to be cooler than the um, air temperature. But still, as we see a warming climate, we're going to have warming soils and um, more of that warming. So we're going to see more females and this is going to cause a big issue for their populations. And then with invasive species, similar thing, right? We're seeing species spread into new areas that they otherwise weren't because of temperatures making these um, ranges more optimal for certain invasive species. Yeah, thank you. That was thank good. you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So I, I've got a quick question. Okay. Um, we're talking about, you know, mostly focusing on, on you know, waste and, and how that attracts, you know, the ravens and coyotes, but also through the desert, there's a lot of aqueducts kind of going around there. Does that, to what extent does that impact, especially the ravens um, as the water source? That's a good question and not something I'm as familiar with. Um, you know, I certainly know more about the aqueducts moving from like uh, Northern California to Southern, like north, near Los Angeles. And we've got the um, aquifers on the Colorado River and the aqueducts there. But I don't know how much of that is uncovered in the desert is above ground. You know, it would be something worth looking into or if some of that is put into more pipes because of the issues with evaporation out here. Um, so unfortunately, I haven't studied that as much, but I would imagine if you have uncovered sources of water, you're going to be bringing in those um, animals, especially ravens that can fly over fences and, you know, things like that. And, and then another one is, um, I, I had heard, I'm not sure how accurate this is, maybe you can confirm about where the ravens would sometimes take, um, you know, a baby tortoise and just uh, drop it on the middle of a road and let a car roll, roll over it to crack the shell. Is that a common thing? Um, that's not one that I've heard many people express concern over. Okay. So I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I think it does. But I think it's not as common as them just generally being able to peck through the shell because they can. You know, I think if they're going to do that, it would probably be with a size juvenile that's just over that threshold that's become too big for them to actually peck through the shell. Um, and one of the things that one of those videos alluded to though is, you know, so they're not necessarily naturally eating tortoises, right? Like it's just become a thing since they are more in the desert now, there's more power lines, they're noticing it as a food source and they're actually teaching their young that it is a food source. So scientists are thinking that Preying on tortoises has become more of a learned behavior for ravens that they're passing down. And so I would think what you're talking about could go along with that, right? That maybe not every raven's doing it, but kind of like right. monkeys that are using tools, you know, when right. um, one demonstrates it, then it becomes more prevalent in a smaller population. Yeah. Um, so I would just want to show you guys real quick before we move on to more questions. I did include references for you in case anybody wanted to look up some of those papers later. Um, so, you know, if you're provided with these slides, which I don't mind sharing, then you can look those up. Um, 
And I would also like to thank everybody for listening today. I really appreciate you tuning in. Um, and with that, I will take any more questions if you have them. Sherry, I have a question. I'll just get it started. What, how, what do you think we could do on a larger scale of waste management in the desert? What, you know, the, obviously the animals are a problem, but like maybe systematically, have you thought about some systematic ways that we could better manage our trash rather than just, you know, um, I don't know, putting it actually in a trash can or a secure trash can. Is there a bigger picture to this maybe? Um. Well, I definitely think that having a more secure trash can like as a baseline would be very important because, you know, the military base, I've seen it, their lids aren't secure. They do blow open in the wind or Marines open them. They don't think about it. But even in my own neighborhood, like I live in a multi um, apartment complex. And so I'll throw away trash and close the lid, but then I'll look at, out there again later that day. It's open, you know, and I don't know, is that my neighbor leaving it open? Did the wind blow it open? Or actually the other day I was doing a run and I saw someone pull over and start going through my trash, you know, so it's kind of a problem to have these like readily accessible trash cans. I think having more secure lids in a way that is required, I guess, so that trash management companies are having to do that, that would be a great first start, right? As well as there really does need to be more enforcement for dumping and things like that, because you have a lot of vacant lots. You have a lot of areas that aren't developed. And I think some people, when they see that, they think, oh, it's a prime spot for me to dump my trash. Well, that's a good so, idea, Sherry. I'll just, I'll, I'll add to that. So I don't know how many of you guys have been to Northern California where there's bears, but it is legally required to have a bear-proof dumpster and bear-proof yeah. trash cans. And I think I it's it makes a lot of sense to do that for a lot of different types of wildlife, but it's currently only enforced in bear country. So just to plug an idea for the students, when you're thinking about, you know, waste of resources, sometimes it's, it's hard to make it a resource, but maybe there's a policy change in there. And if there's a policy change of requiring animal proof dumpsters, it's that's a, like a low bar that maybe we could set to start working towards uh, reducing these problems. And along those lines, I have a question about, you know, you listed a lot of the federal partners and and other collaborators on your efforts. Do you get cooperation from the county to deal with this kind of dumping of trash and ensuring that the dumpsters are properly, um, you know, closed and secure or and or any kind of local municipalities? Are they part of this effort as well? So that is another great question. And, you know, I don't actually think so. Um, that's one thing that we've talked a lot about because we have um, just recently issued uh, what's called a programmatic environmental assessment for Raven management. And we're trying to work with lots of different military installations across the um, desert, as well as BLM and other agencies to do Raven management on a broader scale in the desert but we don't have the local municipality as a part of that. And we've talked about that as a problem in terms of, well, we can reduce trash subsidies on base, right? Like we can focus on that. We can try and put more efforts into it, but Ravens, they fly, right? They're not just staying on the base. They are coming in from 29 Palms from the town. And so if everybody else isn't managing their trash, but we are, yeah, we're helping to reduce the issue, but only by so much. And you're absolutely right. Like, that, unfortunately, I think is a larger issue to tackle than I'm able to, but it's something that we need more awareness on and we need to start working. Um, when I say we, the federal government, right, working more with local municipalities to solve some of these problems. That is my opinion. <laughs> yes, good points too, Sherry. All right, any also, questions? And you guys can ask general questions about tortoises too. Sherry's pretty knowledgeable about desert wildlife in general. So, you know, it's your opportunity. If you've just got a, just a nail biting desert ecology question, this is what I call her for. So you guys can call her for this too. So one cool thing about desert tortoises is they actually spend over 90% of their lives underground. 
Most people don't realize that. Most of the time they're in the borough. And from October till about March, they stay in the borough. They'll only come up for like really nice and warm days to get a little bit of sun. Well, if, if no one else has any questions, I'll remind you guys that we're doing another webinar at one o'clock and Frank uh, Bradley is going to be leading that. He's on the Envirothon wildlife team. And we're going to be talking about wildlife and human interactions uh, around trash and dumping in Napa County. So totally different ecosystem, a little bit different problems. So related topic. So after you come back from lunch, make sure you properly dispose of all your food waste. And then you can join us again uh, to learn about Napa wildlife. And I put the link to that webinar in our chat, just in case um, any of you didn't get the email. Um, but yeah, if I, we really thank you, Sherry, for doing this. This is wonderful. Um, we will uh, send the slides out to students if you're if that's okay. Yeah, that's um, fine. Yeah, and I because we'll probably do some test questions related to some of these things that we shared and just these ideas of bioaccumulation and subsidies to diet. So think about that when, when we're thinking about how our trash and our waste influences wildlife. Those are really important uh, terms and concepts that you taught us about today. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate your time. And we hope to see you again at one. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And Sherry, if you'll end the recording too. Yeah, that's what I was about to do. Okay. <laughs>